can you talk a little bit more about what the current uh, treatment landscape looks like for patients with upper limb spasticity um, following a stroke or TBI? I think the fact that you haven't heard much about it is because it is way underdiagnosed and treated. And, and just briefly, I'll tell you why. There's two groups of doctors or two groups of clinicians who take care of stroke and TBI patients. The first one is when you first have your stroke. Well, that's a, like a life-threatening thing. You're in the hospital, you're getting clot-busting drugs, yada, yada, and then you go home. And basically, most of the time, you're lost to follow-up. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, uh, in the majority of stroke patients, you're getting tightening, stiffness, pain, decreased range of motion, decreased use, but no one's really keying in on that. And patients don't know that there's even treatment. So the standard of care, the kind of the NIH consensus first line are the botulinum neurotoxins. Mm -hmm. So in this country, we have um, onobotulinum, which is Botox. We have abobotulinum, which is dysport, And we have incobotulinum toxin, uh, which is Xeomin. Uh, but, you know, it, even those approved drugs are not used near as often as they should be because patients just kind of are not told, hey, this spasticity can be a big deal in your life, can be painful, can be disfiguring, and can be treated. So it's underused. The advantage of the DAXI, uh, in my opinion, is that because of the, the way the um, core botulinum toxin molecule, there's something else added to it, uh, something proprietary discovered at Stanford University, it lasts longer. And that's been borne out by several other studies in, in, in uh, cosmetics, glabellar lines. I think it's borne out in cervical dystonia. So wouldn't it be nice if you had a drug that worked really well to relieve spasticity uh, and lasted longer? Mm -hmm. And do you feel as though that um, the lack of awareness that, or maybe not even just lack of awareness, but people just not knowing about um, the help that they can get. Do you feel as though that that's something that's an educational issue or is that something that should be just brought more into the clinical care that, that isn't talked about enough or isn't brought up when you go into a hospital and you, people may not know that this might be the effect afterwards? Yeah, I, I think for, for, for years, working with some of the companies, I've tried to do patient education materials and a long-term post-stroke checklist, mm -hmm. which is still sort of in development now. Um, but the idea is the first thing you do with a stroke patient is try to save his or her life, get them on the right medicines, get a little physical therapy started, and then get them out. Um, the way our broken healthcare system is, is that we all kind of are in silos and sometimes those silos don't communicate with one another. When a patient is home, they usually follow up with their uh, antiplatelet medicine and their cholesterol medicine with the primary care doctor. They may go to a neurologist, not all of whom are, are well versed in the use of these medicines. Uh, they may see a physical therapist and that's a complicated thing too. Some therapists know that the botulinum toxins exist and they don't think that they are quote natural. Some physical therapists, and I happen to be married to a physical therapist, so I've got an inside scoop, um, think that if one has Botox done, it takes away from their ability to make money by doing more PT sessions. So it's really complicated. Um, I think patients should be given a uniform patient stroke post-stroke checklist that includes skin and bladder and sexuality and sleep and depression and you could also include spasticity and they can just go through and check those boxes and say have i done all these things to enhance the quality of my life post-stroke or tbi 